Welcome to Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to one person or group of people this week. Today we talk to an up-and-coming PI who is from Romania, lives in the Netherlands, and is heavily invested in China. Here we go. Episode 44 of Copy Traders Club, and today we shine the spotlight on Vlad D35, one of the lesser known PIs, but one whose record suggests he may be more in the limelight in years to come. He's out of the limousine and approaching the entrance to the clubhouse. I'm not as fluent in Romanian as I used to be, but we'll give it a go. Vlad, buna, bun venit la Copy Traders Club. Wow, that's actually way better than I expected. <laughs> Bună ziua, Gavin. Well, thank you for that. And you are indeed very welcome to Copy Traders Club, Vlad. I know you've listened to one or two episodes, so you know that security is tight here. And you need to answer a series of quick fire questions to get past reception. <laughs> Let's do it. Username on eToro. Vlad D35. Date you joined eToro? Uh, must have been somewhere in the beginning of September 2020. Date you became a popular investor? I became a popular investor uh, in the beginning of November 2020. Year of birth? 1997. I'm quite a young one. <laughs> Place of residence? Amsterdam, Netherlands. Profession? I work as a data analyst, uh, but I'm also a student for, I'm just finishing my master's. Briefly state what you aim to achieve on eToro. My, my goals on eToro are to get as close to Warren Buffett's performances. Name one of your investing heroes. As you could tell from my previous answer, that would be Warren Buffett, but that's not necessarily for his strategy, but for his consistency. Name one of your favorite investing books. That would be The Little Book of Valuation by Asvath Damodaran. That completes the formalities. Let's proceed now, Vlad, into our VIP section here at the clubhouse. The Splendid Copy Traders Lounge. Vlad Daniel Diku, a.k.a. Vlad D35. Are you ready for this magical transition? I'm all ready. Okay, Vlad, take it easy now. Put your feet up and enjoy the Copy Traders Lounge. You're the first Romanian we've had here. I hope you enjoyed that little welcome in your mother tongue. Yes, I'm very happy with it and actually very honored that you took the trouble to, to learn such a, a difficult language. You say it's difficult, but I've heard it described as the forgotten romance language related to Italian and Spanish and so on. For example, how do you say good evening in Romanian? Uh, good evening is actually very much like uh, the Spanish and Italian, of course. It's buona sera, which is very much like buona sera. Now, actually, Romanian is, uh, is one of my little jokes that actually everybody uh, that's not Italian or Spanish would uh, mistake Romanian for Italian or Spanish. But Italians and Spanish would mistake it for Russian or Polish. Right. So it's the language that nobody can, uh, can identify. Well, I've been to Romania many years ago, several years before your birth, as it turns out. On a ski trip with my school, we went to Sinaia. That's a very beautiful destination. It was very beautiful. It was before the fall of Nicolae Ceausescu, would you believe? Oh. That's me showing my age. 
So I'm thinking it was about 87 or 88. Okay, so that was close to the fall. Uh, it's interesting because, yeah, before the revolution, the going in and out of the country, as far as I understood, was pretty difficult. Well, a bunch of school children from Belfast managed it okay. And my lasting memory of that trip was that me and a few friends on day one met these guys who offered to exchange our money at fantastic rates. And so we did it. And they were cool guys. There was no danger. And then we went and told the teachers what exchange rate we'd got. And they couldn't believe it. So then (laughs) I offered to introduce the teachers to my new friends, Bogdan and Sebastian or something. (laughs) And uh, they exchanged loads of the kids' money with these guys, far better than any bank would give us. (laughs) Okay, yeah, that's pretty funny because... Yeah, I've also heard stories. Uh, such people would, uh, yeah, would smuggle a, ro- a lot of, uh, yeah, of uh, stuff from from Yugoslavia back then. And yeah, they needed a, a safe way to to store their their value. But we had a good time. I enjoyed it very much. Let's talk some more about Romania. Fun Romania facts. Vlad the Impaler is in fact from Romania. That's right. Uh, Vlad the Impaler, Dracula, actually. He is from a city that's close to mine, and that city is from Transylvania. But back then, he was king of Valachia. Okay. Romania is a country of 21 million people. That surprised me. It's a lot more than I thought. And makes me feel better about the fact that Romania famously lost a penalty shootout to Ireland in the 1990 World Cup, allowing Ireland to reach the quarterfinals, our best ever performance in an international tournament. Yeah, Romania used to be pretty good at football. Now, I mean, I personally support Germany for football. That's how bad we are. No Georgi Hadjis anymore? No, no Georgi Hadji anymore, or Jacob Pesco or anything. Yeah, my dad would would cry after the long, uh, long gone days. I haven't even seen those. Okay, let's talk a little about how I came across you. You were first mentioned to me in the episode with Lizzie Apukaya, Levy, who tells me that you are in his poker game. Is that still ongoing? Nah, unfortunately it's not still ongoing. But uh, from that small poker group game uh, stemmed a nice uh, uh, group. Levi, Katarina, Adam was also in our group. Uh, who else? Bjorn Krinen, he's also a Dutch guy who was in that group. Yeah, it's a bunch of degenerates, how we like to kid, to, to joke between ourselves. And apparently you're very good at taking their money off them. I'm uh, guilty as charged. Now you live in Amsterdam. How's life in the Netherlands? Rainy. Rainy and windy. That's one thing that is killing my mood every day. How about lockdown at the moment? It's a paper lockdown. I wouldn't even call it a lockdown. The thing is, bars close at 8, which gives us very little room for, uh, for a beer after work. Yeah, that gives us more time to to spend on investing and reading about companies and macroeconomic events. So that's fine. Yes, at least an activity like eToro is something that is kind of pandemic proof to a large extent. I wouldn't even say that it would continue. I would rather say that it's uh, it's been boosted by the by the pandemic. You could see this in the level of uh, new retail investors that have joined all kinds of platforms, including eToro. I think eToro has had its best ever year in 2020 and now going into 2021. So yeah, that's one uh, nice activity to do during the lockdown. Let's get to know a little bit more about you by asking you to tell us something you're very bad at. I'm very bad at uh, being on time. 
the first thing I, I said during my job interview was, hey, don't make me come here at 9 a.m. I'm going to be here at 9.15, 9.30, but then I'm also going to... I'm also willing to stay and work overtime as long as I finish my, my, my tasks. So that's one thing that I'm good at, um, delivering what I promised to deliver. I love how you turned it around there. I'm asking you to tell me something you're bad at and you end up telling me something you're great at. Good, good interview skills. Okay. Let's have a question from the art of people. Can you pick a number between one and 10? I will go with three, my, my birth date. What is your favorite charity organization to support and why? That would be the World Food Program. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm donating monthly uh, to that. It's, it's a small uh, donation. I, I just feel like I'm doing my bit. Uh, also, seeing the the little scuffle between Ellen and the president on Twitter. That was a bit funny. So who knows, maybe in a, in a bit, I won't even have to donate because Ellen would sell $6 billion dollars of, uh, of Tesla and then world hunger is solved. Okay, Vlad, let's get into it a little bit. If I could ask you to turn your attention to your bio and read for the listener the first few paragraphs of that, to give us an idea of what you're all about. Sure thing. It goes like this. Hey, everybody. Please check copy open trades before hitting the copy button. Otherwise, it won't have any immediate effect. Minimum copy amount recommended, 300 bucks, but anything more will bring in more benefits. Always looking for potentially undervalued stocks, so my plan of attack is to hold for the mid and long term. I'm periodically posting about my opinions on different events and discuss my decisions. Always keeping an eye open for opportunities and always being reactive to the stock market's behavior. I always do comprehensive analysis of the stocks before going for them. Okay, that's all pretty clear. Let's talk about a few other different elements of your profile here. How about your risk score? Do you think your risk score is fair? To be honest, yes, because I'm also, my portfolio is not comprised of indexes and ETFs only, but it's also, I mean, I, I think four is a pretty safe score. Well, let me describe your risk score quickly. It moves around a little bit over the last 12 months. Max risk for the past few months has been four. A couple of months prior to that was five. A few months prior to that was six. And then back down to five again. Of course, here at Copy Traders Club, Vlad, we don't deal with the nonsense that is average risk score. It's all about the max risk. So I guess on average, having just said that, your max risk on average is five over the last 12 months. Okay, no, I, I think uh, maxim my average score right now of four is is quite uh, fair, uh, mostly because I've constructed my portfolio in such a way that I could just leave Toro alone, uh, don't care too much for it, and then the the portfolio will be will be safe. But I'm also don't think I would deserve a score lower than that because. Yeah, my portfolio is not comprised of indexes and ETFs only. Okay, if I look at your copier numbers now and your assets under management, copier number 74, assets under management, somewhere between 50 and 100K. When I look at your performance stats, let me just explain those to the listener. You started in September 2020, and for those last four months of the year, you finished with 34.63%. And so far in 2021, you're at 32%. How come you don't have more copiers? <laughs> yeah, that's not for me to, to judge. Uh, you could see that there was a very steep slope of copiers joining in June, July, actually in June. Uh, June was also 
my second best month this year. And my portfolio is very much deep into China. And then, as we all know, July, the CCP, the Communist Chinese Party, decided to to go all in on all the companies and struck a series of regulations which hit the market pretty badly. And that's why since July, uh, copiers have been pretty hit. Uh, and now they're starting to break even because as you can tell, the rest of the months have been pretty uh, pretty good also compared to, to the overall market. Yes, those numbers are pretty healthy. Your annual numbers are impressive enough, more so than a, someone with copiers in the sub-100 range. I've seen other PIs with similar numbers to you, and they have many hundreds, some a few thousand copiers. Yeah. What's it going to take for you to get to that sort of level, do you think? Or what are you not doing that you could be? Uh, to be honest, I've had a period uh, where I didn't post as much. That didn't mean that I didn't read and didn't. I was uh, kept out of the loop for in terms of what's happening to my portfolio. But I didn't post as much. And I think that actually hurt my engagement. Uh, I've restarted doing that. Last week, for example, I've posted five times, I believe. This week has been a bit more quiet. It's also a bit of a struggle because you're creating this post, 5,000 characters, uh, trying to go as deep uh, into the specifics, but still trying to convey a very compressed message. And in the end, people don't read it. It's long. It's economics. It's yeah, finances and uh, how... President Biden and Xi Jinping are discussing a virtual meeting. It's not the most thrilling topic ever. Yeah, or maybe I posted about, I don't know, wheat and the cereals output in the world. Of course, that's not the most interesting topic. So yeah, there's a downside. What I should do, I don't know. We'll see. Well, maybe we can explore that a little bit later on. But tell us, where are you in your PI journey? Do you feel like you're just getting started? For sure. Do you have plans to go full-time at some stage? What would that take? Uh, that would be the dream, to be able to go full-time as a PI. Uh, but of course, I would not do it until be it becomes sustainable. I mean, the the compensation I re receive right now from eToro, it's symbolic i'm using that one as i actually said this to my copiers i'm here 100 percent. everything that i'm getting from itoro i'm just reinvesting back into itoro especially to tell them hey this is where i'm putting my money as the the english saying goes uh put your money where your mouth is that's exactly what i'm doing okay trades per week and average holding time Trades per week, 2.95. Average holding time, five months. Does that paint an accurate picture of your investment strategy? To be honest, seeing the 2.5 figure, I would still say it's maybe too high. Uh, of course, I would have some weeks where the, the market is going down and then yeah, you have to seize the opportunity, get as much, buy as many dips as you can. In general, no, I wouldn't say that I'm on a day trader, an active trader, or however you want to call it. And then again, the average holding time of five months, I still think it's it's too little. Pretty much always when I'm uh, going for uh, any position, any asset, I have a minimum time frame of one year. And I wouldn't even say the maximum. But when I'm doing the discounted cash flow, it's for five years at least. The next topic I'd like to discuss is communications, and you've already kind of mentioned that, that your communications are eToro-centric insofar as you do posts on eToro. Do you engage with people via any other media? So in terms of social media, I'm not. 
uh, yet. I'm not uh, active anywhere else, but uh, I have always been very open to discuss with existing copiers, with followers, with potential copiers, uh, usually on Telegram, uh, whenever they would have any any topic that they would uh, ask for my opinion. Uh, I'm gladly, I've had conversations of hours maybe to try to guide them as much as possible. Oof, I'm not sure if I should be saying this uh, because it's still uh, in a backlog. It's uh, one of my plans for the near medium term. I actually want to, to start a social media and a blog post that is actually conveying my true conviction about the market. Markets are silly and we have to take full advantage of that. I thought you were about to announce the launch of a YouTube channel. No, actually, I would do these uh, silly market stuff, uh, post, blog post, however you want to call it. I would do it uh, not in my name because, yeah, I don't think my face is the, the YouTube face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, can, I can understand that. This is an audio podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That sounded like I'm extremely ugly. Hopefully I'm not. No, but I'm, I'm not the type that would engage in, in that way, mostly because I don't want people to copy me because of, yeah, this is me, this is how I look, this is who I am. I want copiers to copy me because they have the conviction that I am uh, the right person for them in terms of, okay, I agree with his views. I agree with his analysis. And that doesn't require a face for that. Sure, but it's not necessary to be someone other than yourself on YouTube videos. You could still present the true, authentic Vlad on YouTube videos. And you don't think that would be an important part of someone who's trying to build their PI profile? That would be. That would surely be. I, we actually had a conversation a while ago with, with Katarina and she pointed out this perfectly. A successful investor does not mean a successful PI. I just saw, interestingly enough, today, a PI was asking on eToro something along the lines of what do copiers really want? And various PIs answered him, including Jay and Ishfak. And I contributed by saying that it strikes me there's room for lots of different types of PIs on eToro. You don't need to try and out JJ or out Yepe Yepe. Not everyone's looking for the best male investor from that background. You know, there's people copy for a, a myriad different reasons. And some PIs are becoming very successful by bringing their personalities to bear on the platform. And people are attracted by all sorts of different things. That's true. And what I've noticed, uh, so there's two things. They are, there are copiers that are more risk averse. As you can see, uh, Olivier, he is one of the most successful PIs. And then still his returns are very safe, yet still not that high. Whereas there are other uh, investors such as Jay, for example, who is very technology oriented, very innovation oriented. He's actually a very, very big, uh, I wouldn't say hater, but he's very against uh, oil and fossil fuels, for example. So each PI has its own style, his own approach. This crypto boom recently and the last year's small cap expansion, growth, boom, however you want to call it, that has created pretty unhealthy opinion about the stock market. You see random people on eToro uh, making fun of PIs. Oh, you're only 25% up this year, whereas 25% is, is, a, is an amazing figure. But yeah, they are used to having all sorts of cryptocurrencies going up thousand percent overnight 
And yes, that's created a very, very unhealthy opinion about the stock market. So what copiers want, yeah, they, I think they just want to identify themselves to some extent with the PI. Dear listener, just a little pause here to say a few things directly to you. The calendar is full until the end of the year. That will mean 52 episodes, which seems like a good time to pause and call it season one and take stock. It's been a lot of fun and a lot of time and effort, but I'm pleased to be creating something of value for eToro users, particularly copy traders. Whether there will be a season two depends on a number of factors. I say it elsewhere, but I want to repeat it again here to really encourage a little action from you. If you want to see the podcast continue, you can help by bringing more listeners in. A lot of people still don't know about Copy Traders Club, so post about it on your PI's feed in eToro. Mention it on a Facebook group or in whatever Discord groups you're in. That's not too much of an ask, is it? On the podcast apps, there's always a share function that includes copy link. Use that. Or copy the YouTube channel link and share that. Or share a link to your favorite episode. There are many ways to eat an orange. I also have one of those affiliate links for new eToro signups in every episode's show notes. So if you know someone interested in signing up, please copy and send them that link and help support the show that way. Now, I know these calls to action that you hear on podcasts can easily be ignored, and I always ignore them myself. Let's be honest. But this time, I am asking you, as someone who listens to and enjoys this one-person independent podcast, to make a little effort to help it along. You can even press pause and take two minutes to do it right now. If you do, know that I am grateful. If you don't, every time you hear this bit, you will be overcome with a crippling sense of guilt and unworthiness. Until you do. Back to the show. Now let's get into your portfolio a bit more, Vlad. In terms of asset classes, approximately stocks, 92%, ETFs, 8%. And then you have a cash position of 16%. Is that kind of the normal spread? I usually add money, add new funds uh, once a quarter. Uh, this time it has happened that the the new funds that I've allocated were a bit higher. So that way it's actually at 16%. And I'm slowly consuming that cash position until the next funds addition. I usually like to have uh, money on hand so that whenever there's an opportunity that arises that I can seize it. We see markets being silly and overreacting all the time and the next day one stock goes down 20% because of a revenue miss, but then investors sit on it, digest it and realize, oh, but earnings have actually gone up 50, 60%. And the next day the stock goes back to where it was, maybe even higher. So yeah, that's why I like to, to keep this, this funds on hand. And in terms of the distribution between stocks, ETFs, indices, uh, I mostly like to to go with uh, with stocks, and uh, because that's where I can actually analyze the specifics of a company. If I'm going for an ETF, then I usually have to look first of all at the macro level, which I'm already doing for the specific stocks, and you kind of lose track if it, you're going for an ETF. You don't know what is influencing what. That gets a bit trickier. I would say 
with futures and indices, I don't really like to uh, to invest in them because you never know when it. I mean, you know when they're gonna expire, but your reasoning might not prove right before they expire. So that's why I usually try not to not to go too much for indices for future for commodities. You could see on my portfolio, I have a one point eight two percent uh trades in indices those were short-term hedges i was yeah, shorting nasdaq uh, while it was going up irrationally high but then i decided okay i'm gonna stop this it's it's just not worth it given what we've spoken about so far your hero is warren buffett and the words in your bio are terms like you're always looking for undervalued stocks you're a mid to long term holder. You do lots of research. I'm wondering why you don't describe yourself as a value investor. Do you feel like you are a value investor or is that too limiting a term? So that depends on how you define value investing. If you define it as uh, Warren Buffett, as an investor who is only holding stocks that are paying dividends, then no. Usually I'm actually against dividends, especially from US companies, because it's double taxed money. And we don't want money to go to the government. We want money to land in our pockets. I am, however, some sort of value investor because yeah, I'm going there for, for the value. I'm not going too much for, for the hype. I'm usually not, don't try to go where the herd is going. I'm looking for, yeah, potentially undervalued stocks. Okay, so running my eye down your portfolio, as you mentioned before, there's plenty of China in there. Quite a number of your largest positions are in China, in fact. Your top 10 holdings include QFIN, JD.com, Baidu, Yadia and Xinyi Solar. And then there are a good few more outside of your top 10. So talk a little bit about investing in China and the problems that you've encountered this year and also why your annual return isn't much lower than it is <laughs> given the proportion of Chinese stocks and the problems that Chinese stocks have had. How come you're still at 30% plus? Yeah, well, I think that has to do with, with the moment. I mean, I don't think I know. It has to do with the moment I actually started buying these companies. So, for example, Baidu, I bought it at 40% discount. Vips, the same. JD, same. Qfin, I actually started buying that one in 2020 when it was trending around $10 a share. It has actually gone up some point in February, I believe, up to $45 a share. And I still thought that, okay, this still is a gem. I'm not going to sell this one. No, I think China is, is a blessing in disguise, should I put it like this? And I think most investors, big investors, are pretty wrong on China and they're, uh, yeah, them being scared of it. I believe... China has actually shown throughout the last 30 years that it's actually very capitalist-minded. Um, you can see this in how fast the economy has grown. One indicator that I found extremely interesting was that the exports levels, the volumes, have actually gone up, but the exports share contribution to the total GDP have actually gone lower, which basically means that China has become so self-sufficient. It's actually growing from inside a lot, whereas the rest of the world is still depending on China. And then what I think uh, that investors got very wrong is that they are looking at China through the lens of, yeah, of the Western world. They expect Chinese companies and Chinese billionaires and politicians to behave as they would behave in the US, which is not the case. 
I mean, I I think that it's is unfair of me to say this that uh, coming from uh, an ex-communist country, but still I'm too young to have actually experienced communism. But you could still see the the marks that communism have have left on on Romania. Uh, and coming back to China, this is something that. I mean, I was not afraid at all in July when actually all the stocks, all Chinese stocks have been going down. And that's because I could actually see the CCP taking the right measures for uh, the investment in environment to become more safe, more more healthy, more transparent. They, as leadership, they are taking a lot of decisions, or at least this is how I see it. They are taking a lot of decisions for the people and not so much for for the companies. But seeing that it's a population of 1.3, 1.4 billion, of course you have to take decisions for the people. If the people are doing right and doing fine, so will the companies. What's also another interesting fact about China is that they actually have the highest saving rate in the world. About 50% of what Chinese households are earning they are saving, which basically means that at this point, we are seeing a figure of $34 trillion that are just in, maybe not even a savings account, they are just at home kept uh, being kept safe. The number of retail investors at this point in China stands at about 12%. That has gone up about 2% in the last 10 years, which might not seem a lot, like a lot, but it's still like 80 million people. It's a new Germany that started investing over the last 10 years. That's a lot. And if we look at the other side of the ocean in the US, it's between 50 and 60% throughout the history. Now imagine if all these Chinese people that are just saving money slowly started investing those money into the stock market. Imagine how much money the companies would be able to raise. And of course, if the company grows, so should the stocks. Well, that's some very interesting stuff there, Vlad, about the overall picture in China and what you foresee happening there in time. Let's talk a little bit more specifically. NEO is a stock you bought in February and March of 2021. So you're currently down on that position. Now, a bear might say there's a huge gulf between vehicle sales and market cap. So loads of future trouble-free growth is currently priced in. It's priced like it's a shoe-in as a future market leader in an increasingly crowded industry where so many have come and gone. So there's no room for mistakes for such a seriously capital-intensive business. The bear might wonder, where is your margin of safety in this investment? Would such a bear give you pause? No, actually, Neo has been one of my first holdings ever. Before I joined uh, eToro, I was investing on some other platform. And also, you are seeing this the most recent acquisitions. Before that, I had closed some trades with NEO. I hope I'm not mistaken, all of those were, were in profit. And again, I bought as a dip when the, the stock started going down. I know that the, this market doesn't leave any, any room for, for error, unless your name is Tesla and your uh, CEO is Elon Musk, then you're allowed to, to make mistakes. But what caught my eye about NEO, besides the extreme growth that we've seen uh, over the last two years, year over year growths of double, even triple digits in terms of outputs, in terms of revenues. Yeah, I just think it's amazing. But why I believe NEO is a winner is that it has government backing. It's one. I don't want to be mistaken, but I assume two or three big government contracts. 
So yeah, in China, if the CCP has your back, then you're set. Even in the case of continued dilution? Even in the case of continued dilution, because everybody started buying it, me including, this is the next Tesla. But the next Tesla needs needs capital to grow. I still think that where NEO is right now in its growth journey is miles above where Tesla used to be at, at the same uh, point in their history. How do you see things going forward for China and over what time period are you looking at price recovery? I admit that going forward, uh, China might not look as rosy as it used to look a few months back. That's because economic uh, slowdown has actually can actually be a bit visible. It's still putting it side by side with the US. It's the far better picture. It's the far better destination. People look at China as an emerging market, and that's why they are expecting this uh, emerging market to actually go double, triple digits growth. Of course, that's not going to be the case. China has developed into a mature market, so it should be compared to the US, not to India or other emerging markets. In terms of price recovery, I hope, feel that it shouldn't take too long. But even if it does, it's the end destination that matters. And even if the price recovery will not be as steep as the price decline, it's the small steps that matter. Speaking of small steps, you did a post on eToro about a week ago with a graphic of a guy climbing a flight of stairs, showing that seemingly small steps can lead to a big change. In that post, you also discussed your investment strategy and how you go about identifying investment opportunities. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, exactly. So seemingly small steps lead to a very big change over time. I might get a bit philosophical with this, uh, this reply, but in my free time, I actually like running long distances. I've actually taken part in quite a few semi-marathons, but I hate sprinting. I don't think that, and I think investment investing is exactly the same. You cannot go full throttle, 100 meters, go boom, and then expect that uh, that pace to, to last. You have to take seemingly small steps for a very big goal. And in your investing strategy, you talk about your approach. You're a fundamental analysis investor as opposed to technical. You seem to be what might be called macro top-down and bottom up if i can borrow some phrases from robert Merck's approach no that that's uh, actually a very good uh, description of my approach as i say here in my strategy when i try to describe it i start off with a hunch about the microeconomic event idea i need to understand if the industry is going to in the right direction i understand that i might be wrong about the specific company that i'm going for but i would rather have a mediocre company in my portfolio that is going in the right direction along with the herd, because then again, it will do well rather than have a very good company that, but that's active in an industry that's going down. So you literally start with the macro idea. It's not the opposite where you see a company that has dropped in price and you think there could be reasons for it being currently undervalued. And then you start your research into that area. Do you start without any preconceived ideas about your ultimate investments? The other way could also be the case if some company would just pop into my, oh, this is actually screaming, hey, buy me, uh, and the market just gets it wrong. Usually, I try to look around and see, okay, where is this going? What macroeconomic uh, events have actually happened? What's the current state of the market. That's my idea. And then I try to validate it. 
if it's a bias and I need to confirm it, if it's actually a very good idea and that's a contrarian idea, I still need to confirm it. Try to understand where is the market going. Uh, after I've done my research and I'm still convinced that my idea was the right one, then I start looking for potentially undervalued companies. And usually I do this, first of all, through a relative evaluation. I try to look at the multiples, which companies are rightfully fairly priced, which companies have, are actually expected to grow more. After I've narrowed it down to two, three, four companies, then I start making the comparison between these. Try to understand what moat does each company have? How does this, do these companies differentiate themselves? Uh, in parallel, I'm trying to pinpoint, okay, what's the interesting value? Try to go deep into their financials. Try to understand is the company, where is the, the, uh, the biggest upside? You also say you're always going to be fair and open about your strategies and never gamble our money. And you reference diversification in that post. Can you give us some examples of how you go about that? Okay, so as I mentioned before, of course, I'm here to invest my money and I'm, and I'm also here to invest my copiers' money. I'm not willing to, to gamble, to place any bets based on yeah speculation. You could actually see it in my portfolio. There is actually no no cryptos and that's something that some followers have actually uh bashed me for but yeah let's not go in that direction and in terms of diversification this is also something that i okay this is this is a personal idea but i think that being too diversified especially as a copier who's not as an investor who's not doing this uh full time that is going to screw up your uh, your portfolio because you won't be able to keep track of what's happening you won't you will become disconnected with with your portfolio if you have too many stocks if you have too many positions you mean exactly exactly okay so what does diversification mean in vlad 35's portfolio my portfolio diversification means uh, having a high number of companies yet still not too high my magic number that i've come up with was 35 and i tried not to deviate too much from this number at the moment i have 37 assets in my portfolio but of course diversification is not only numbers it means also industries it means also sectors within those industry it means uh different markets it means different company different countries different continents different everything as long as you are balanced in your portfolio, you can keep track of what's happening and you can keep track of what's happening at the macro level, then you're set. Okay, why don't you tell us a little bit about your best ever investment? My best ever investment, I think, would be Qfin, 360 Digitech. That's a fintech company that I've actually grown to I shouldn't say this as uh, as an investor because you're supposed to be as detached from your investment. But every earnings, I'm getting more and more and more impressed of what they uh, managed to achieve. Why don't you impress us with details of your worst ever investment? <laughs> My worst ever investment would be an investment I didn't make. I have the company right now in my portfolio. It's actually one of my biggest losers. Uh, but I think that, again, the market is being silly and is overreacting. That would be Digital Turbine. I initially came across this company while it was trending around $7 a share. Maybe I think even less. And two reasons. First of all, I didn't have the capital to buy. And then second of all, I saw that, okay, it's overhyped. I could not go that much into the specifics of why the company is growing this much. Now that it has actually grown this much and yeah, I'm seeing that all these big acquisitions that they've made have actually created these 
perfect ecosystem in their uh, industry. All this ecosystem is complementing uh, one company is complementing each other. Yeah, not pulling the trigger uh, sooner. That was my worst investment decision. Right, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your copiers. What sort of person should copy you? Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a open person and I always discuss my my decisions. And this is what I would also expect from, from my copiers. Somebody that's fairly open-minded, somebody that is willing to discuss my uh, my decisions in terms of investing, someone that is not afraid of challenging me and uh, would like to understand more about what, what's happening, and someone who is here for the long run. It's actually something that I've noticed across PIs uh, that they've actually complained about this. A lot of copiers, they're joining and they're leaving after one day some after even one hour that's not how investment works you're just paying the spreads for if you're just if you're doing this that's not benefiting anyone i want by my side uh copiers that are here for the long run what role should you as a pi play in a copier portfolio and can you describe what you think that ideal portfolio would look like with you in it whenever my friends would ask for, okay, how should I make my portfolio? Should I just go all in and just copy you? I am being as fair as possible and tell them that no, diversification is also important even as a, as a copy trader if you're just trying to make a portfolio out of PIs. I think that my portfolio would be a nice addition alongside other PIs who maybe are not as involved in China, uh, other PIs who might not be so inclined into tech. I also think that maybe copiers should not limit themselves only to, uh, to PIs, but then maybe if they don't want to invest any energy in it, just go for some ETFs, some indexes. In your ideal copier portfolio, how many PIs would there be? If you were copying, how many PIs would you have? If I were copying, I would say seven or eight copy uh, PIs. That would be uh, that. That would cover everything. And of course, some might go up, some might go down. As long as you're balanced, that's fine. What changes would you like to see on eToro? Whew. That's a very long discussion that we engaged in. <laughs> no, I think eToro should become more of a transparent platform in terms of PI engagements. I feel like at this point, only a certain amount of PIs get recognition, get visibility. One other thing that I would really, really like about eToro uh, would be to increase the, the the offering because it would happen to me a lot of times that I would just go look for companies and then, oh, this looks like an amazing opportunity and I'm looking for it and it's not there. And I know liquidity is an issue. It's not only, it's not limited to eToro. So that would be understandable. How early in your research do you check to see if any of these potentially interesting companies are on eToro early on so you don't waste too much time? It's the third step uh, in, my, in my strategy as described in that post that we've talked about before. Once I narrow, managed to narrow my search to a few companies, that's when I tried to, to look, okay, is this on eToro or not? But it doesn't, doesn't stop me from going into that industry. So for example, if I have a company, if I'm going to industry, I don't know, finance, and I see a company X, that sounds amazing. It's not there on eToro. I go for company Y that is there. It's pretty frustrating if you're excited about an opportunity though, and it doesn't show up. Yeah, it has happened actually. 
a few times and by the time they've actually managed to to add it to the platform the price levels have gone up too much that's what the crypto guys complain about too by the time it gets on to eToro the opportunity has to some extent passed but we're not here to complain uh, too much about eToro I, of course i don't want to complain too much because yeah in the end they're still adding a lot of a lot of companies a lot of stocks to the platform so if the opportunity passed now who knows maybe it will come back in a few months a few years it's good that we are here to to take advantage of it i didn't i don't really don't want my answer to come off as as negative because at the end of the day itoro is still an amazing platform the usability is amazing i mean even inexperienced traders can just can actually start their investment careers investment journeys on on itoro and then what itoro managed to do with uh, with the pi program that's something amazing and it has actually opened a lot of doors for for retail investors and of course for copy traders very nice. Okay, final question. Vlad, if you were in my shoes, what one question would you have liked to have asked yourself that I didn't? The S&P and Nasdaq have actually grown like crazy recently. So where do we do I see this going? Because if looking back in the history, this growth might prove to be unsustainable. And I think that one major event that's going to happen in the next few months would be the Federal Reserve uh, in the US increasing the uh, the interest rates and then the monetary policy will not become so easy as it's been for the last year and a half almost 2 years and that's why I think a lot of people should position themselves for that I see opportunity in in the in the payments industry so in finances, uh, in food, I think unfortunately we will have a bit of scarcity in terms of in terms of food, which will drive up the prices. And of course, the traditional hedges against inflation, inflation, real estate, gold, and other precious metals. So I think that people, copiers, investors, whoever should try to position themselves just already start to position themselves in that direction. Well, it's interesting to hear how you're positioning yourself, Vlad, both for the market conditions coming up and indeed for your future journey on eToro. I look forward to seeing how you progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vlad D35, for being here at the Copy Traders Clubhouse. Pleasure was mine. There you go, listener. That was Vlad D35. Check him out. A very nice guy who seems to believe very much in his approach and enjoys his relationship with his copiers. It'll be fun to see how he gets on in the years ahead. That's all from me. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to one person or group of people this week. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously anything you hear in this podcast is for entertainment only, not financial advice. Do your own research. This is just generic chit-chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth. 